Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Our text for this morning is our Old Testament lesson from Isaiah chapter 42. Before the sermon, I'll reread the last half of our text, beginning with verse 18. Hear, you deaf, look, you blind, and see. Who is blind but my servant and deaf like the messenger I send? Who is blind like the one committed to me, blind like the servant of the Lord? You have seen many things, but have paid no attention. Your ears are open, but you hear nothing. It pleased the Lord for the sake of his righteousness to make his law great and glorious. So far, God's word. In the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who wants all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth, to your Christian friends. Well, you see the sermon theme right there in the bulletin. The deaf will hear, the blind will see. And then given the reading that we just had as our gospel reading, Jesus healing the blind man, you might very well expect that we're going to be talking about Jesus' power, Jesus' miracles, Jesus' ability to heal us no matter what is wrong with us. But that really isn't the point this morning. Yes, Jesus performed many miracles. He spit on the ground, made mud, put it on the man's eyes, and he was able to see. In another scripture, he put his fingers in the ears of a deaf man, shouted out, Ephatha, and the man was able to hear. Jesus healed the lame, making those who could not walk able to walk. Jesus cast out demons from those who were demon-possessed. He healed people of fatal fevers. He even raised people from physical death. That wasn't Jesus' primary mission. It's not as if everyone in Israel who was blind was healed by Jesus. Not everyone who was deaf in Israel was given the ability to hear by Jesus. Not all the crippled were given the ability to walk. Not all those who were sick or had died were brought back to physical life by Jesus. Jesus did these things for a greater purpose, with a greater goal in mind. No, the idea of the deaf hearing and the blind seeing has to do with God's people and how they regarded his word and his promises. The prophet Isaiah, writing 700 years before Jesus was born, was talking to people who had had prophet after prophet come to them and tell them, things are not right here. You are not being fair with your neighbors. You are not living as God's people. We had a covenant, God says. I, as God, promised that I would take care of you. You, in turn, promised that you would worship me and me only. But there were idols among God's people. God's people intermingled and intermarried with heathen nations and brought heathen worship practices. God saw his people not acting like the people that he had set aside from all nations of the world. God was treating his people Israel the way a disappointed father treats a child. You with kids know there are few things more frustrating than when you call your child And although you are absolutely sure your child hears your voice, they don't answer. They don't respond. They're waiting for you to call a second time, a third time, a fourth time. Then they'll know that you really mean it. But that first time, you call out your child's name, they ignore you. Oh. You start to burn with anger and frustration. I'm not saying it's right, but part of you wants to take that child by the shoulders and shake them and ask, are you deaf? Can't you hear? No, I know you hear. Why aren't you listening to me? Or when you tell your child to do something, when you tell them to clean their room, because they've got a week's worth of dirty laundry and all sorts of various papers and magazines scattered all over the floor of their room, 
and you walk by it at four in the afternoon and it looks just as bad as it did at seven in the morning and you know that your child has walked by that room five times during the day and not done anything about it, I'm not saying it's right, but you want to take that child again by the shoulders and turn them and point their head at that room and say, are you blind? Even though you know they're not. They're acting like it. They're acting like they can't see what's right in front of them. That's what God is saying to his people. Are you deaf? I send prophet after prophet to you, and you don't listen to them. In fact, you persecute them. You humiliate them. Sometimes you even kill them. Are you blind? God says to his people. I'm the one who brought you out of slavery in Egypt. I parted the Red Sea for you. I give you everything that you need for body and life. And you act like I'm not even here. You act like my blessings aren't enough for you. No wonder God calls his people Israel a stiff-necked people. Hard to govern people like that. Well, this would be the part of the sermon where we pat ourselves on the back, right? Because we're not like that. Well, except we are. We have a part of us that is absolutely deaf to the Word of God. It doesn't want to hear the Word of God at all. And when the Word of God is proclaimed, or when the Word of God is preached about, we will find all sorts of other things to distract ourselves. The stained glass looks kind of pretty. Oh, the fans are turning at a certain speed this morning. What time is it, actually? There is part of us that does not want to hear the word of God. And there is a part of us that does not want to see the blessings God has given in our lives. It's trained us so well that when two or three things are going wrong in our lives, that will be the only things that we see. And we'll ignore the thousands of things in our lives that are going right. So don't be surprised that God comes to you this morning and uses the same kind of language that he used with his Old Testament people and says to you, are you deaf? You sit here Sunday after Sunday, sometimes in the exact same pew, and you hear how God hates pride, he hates greed, he hates foul language, he hates anger that is misdirected. And then you go out and you act proud, and you show your greed. And you use bad words, and you live selfishly. Are you deaf? Are you blind? Don't be surprised when God uses that same language at us that he used at Old Testament Israel. I mean, compared to Old Testament Israel, how much more do we have than they had? And yet we can focus on that one particular blessing that seems to have eluded us rather than all the blessings that we do have. We can focus on that one thing that seems to be broken rather than all the things that are working correctly. That unrepentant, unregenerated part of us, that part of us that is always going to be deaf, always going to be blind, well, we call that our sinful nature. And our sinful nature is never going to be converted into a believer. And we're going to carry it around with us till the day we die. So it is absolutely right then that God looks at us and calls us deaf, calls us blind. But the deaf will hear. And the blind will see. And we are already proof of that. Because that sinful nature in us doesn't live all by itself. God has created in us a new creation, a new being that hears him and that sees him. It isn't mentioned specifically in our text, but it is alluded to. The good news in our text comes in the absolute last verse of the text. When Isaiah says, it pleased the Lord for the sake of his righteousness to make his law great and glorious. Now, as Lutherans, 
We hear that and we don't automatically hear anything good in there because, well, we are good Lutherans. And we know, we've been trained, there is nothing that we find comfortable about the law. There is nothing that we find reassuring about God's law. It shows us our sin. It shows us where we've let God down. But law, used here the way Isaiah uses it, doesn't just have to do with God's commands. It pleased the Lord for the sake of his righteousness to make his law great and glorious. Law means everything in God's word in this context. It has a meaning something like constitution, general statement. That includes God's promise of a savior. And that is alluded very directly to with the word that comes right before that. It pleased the Lord for the sake of his righteousness. Righteousness was the one word in the Bible that was the key that unlocked the rest of the Bible to Martin Luther. Once he knew what righteousness was, everything else in the Bible made sense. Without it, nothing made sense. Righteousness is that new perspective from which God views us because of what Jesus has done for us. Or going back to Isaiah's time, what God would do in the person and the coming of the Savior. When Martin Luther discovered what righteousness was, he spoke of, spoke of it as if a door had been opened and heaven was available to him. And he was able to walk right in through faith. That's righteousness. And that's righteousness that God wants us to have. We who are by nature deaf, we who are by nature blind and cannot see God for who he is and cannot even hear him when he calls to us unless he himself opens up our ears. That's exactly what he's done. The deaf will hear and the blind will see. Yes, Jesus opened up the ears of the deaf man. Yes, Jesus opened the eyes of the blind man, but he did more than that. In our gospel reading for this morning, the true miracle wasn't granting this man who had been blind from birth sight. It was revealing to him the light of the world. Jesus himself. And in doing so, forgiving the man's sins. Jesus himself asked that question when he was about to heal a lame man. Which is harder, to say, your sins are forgiven, or get up and walk? Jesus' point was, the words are easy to say, but to actually be able to do it, <laughs> to forgive sins is a much greater feat, and Jesus was able to do that through his suffering and death on the cross, to take our sins off of us, and to give us, in, its, in place of our sins, his perfection. That's righteousness. And that's what God upholds, even for us who are partially deaf, partially blind, because of the sinful natures we carry around. So we will, in part, mourn, because we will always be partially deaf and partially blind. But at the same time, we will also rejoice, because we are only partially deaf and partially blind. Part of us can see God. Part of us can hear Him. And one day we will see him fully. And one day we will hear him absolutely clearly when he comes to deliver us. God speaks of his delivering power in the first part of our text as something that's going to be very hard for him to do. So he pulls out as an illustration the hardest physical thing that a human being has to do for a mother to give birth. No way a guy can understand that. But you can see it as a guy and think, wow, glad that's not me. <laughs> but it is amazing what God does through such pain. Soon after the pain is over, the mother and the child are united and although it's been a long, hard pull for both of them, they're happy. The child is comforted in his or her mother's arms, and the mother is thrilled that God used her to bring a life into this world. God says it's going to be hard, but
but I am going to deliver you. And we know how hard it was. We know the price Jesus paid. Now for the people to whom Isaiah was originally writing, there was an intermediary fulfillment of this prophecy. God wasn't just talking about the Savior to come, but was also talking about how he would deliver them out of exile from Babylon. And the words that he uses in this text actually prefigure some of the historical events associated with the fall of Babylon. God speaks of the rivers drying up, the, 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 the islands becoming like pools and, and, and such in our text. And that's kind of what happened. When the Persians defeated the Babylonian Empire and conquered the city of Babylon itself, under King Cyrus. They diverted the Euphrates River. And that was a big deal because the Euphrates River didn't just flow near the city, it flew into the city under the city walls. That wasn't a problem for the Babylonians because it was deep enough that it would never be a threat for an invader to go underneath and come in that way. But by diverting the river, the Persians were able to just walk under the city walls, go in and conquer the city. You can give credit to the Persians for being such great engineers, yes, but more than that, give credit to God for keeping his promises. For that king, King Cyrus, is actually named in Isaiah as the one who would deliver the Jews from exile. God had it planned all along. God has the plans of your life all mapped out as well, though he hasn't revealed them to you. And God has empowered you to do wonderful things for him. In order to do those things, though, you have to be able to know who God is. And God has given that to you. The first song we sang as a congregation was, Open the Eyes of My Heart. And that's scriptural language. You don't think of your heart as having eyes, but in scriptural terms it does. And the eyes of your hearts have been opened. And your ears have been unstopped to hear. Your God calls you to be his child. And you listen and to the best of your abilities obey. Your God shows you what your life means here on earth and where you are going to spend eternity and your eyes are open to it. And you see. The deaf will hear. The blind will see. And you are living proof of that. Praise God for the sight, for the hearing that you have. And praise God, too, that we get to look forward to having perfect sight and perfect hearing with him in heaven forever. Amen. And the peace of God that transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus. Amen.